Thank you so very much, and thank you for allowing me to sit in on the hearing. Appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, I have some prepared questions, but th does anyone else want to elaborate on that? Any other suggestions as far as the long term, uh, the back end? Is there anyone on, on the panel that'd like to, to talk about that? You, you mentioned, and you're so correct, uh, transitional housing uh, and you know, cooperation, obviously, uh, is so very important. Uh, the patient needs to cooperate to, uh, and voluntarily in most cases. Uh, is there anyone who wants to make another comment before I get started? If okay. I could, I would add yeah. um, that the front door is very important because, you know, access to care, mo oftentimes you'll hear families saying, I don't know where to turn for help. And we're looking at a crisis center model as well. And I think that's critically important. You don't know which number to call. You've got a family or a loved one, and you're not sure how to connect them. But then the connection to treatment is critically important as well. It's like someone with hypertension going to the emergency room and getting a pill but not getting a prescription. It's not going to help. And so without the access to care and the kind of supports needed. So recovery housing is critical as well. And, and in part of our um, Cures Act funding, we are looking to establish that kind of transitional housing for individuals who are not able to return to their communities. We really need to look at the long term and treating addiction as a chronic disease, not through acute episodes. So I think that the approach to long-term and looking at the long-term needed supports are critically important as well. Thank you. Uh, in, with regard to Florida in 2010, in response to the opioid crisis in Florida, the, uh, the pill mill problem, I think you probably know about that. Uh, Florida's legislature enacted a statewide tracking of painkiller prescriptions coupled with law enforcement uh, using drug trafficking laws to prosecute uh, providers caught uh, overprescribing. Within three years, Florida saw a decrease of more than 20% in overdose deaths. And I want to give uh, Pam Bond, the Attorney General, uh, and others credit for this. Um, but now the rise in, uh, in fentanyl and its various derivatives have presented new challenges to the state of Florida. And, and other states as well. However, we remain optimistic with recent legislative initiatives in Florida. These include requiring doctors to log prescriptions in a statewide painkiller database by the end of the, the next day. Uh, I think that's important uh, to curb the, the so-called doctor shopping and uh, setting aside states' funds for medication that can help reduce opioid dependency. Uh, so we're working on it, uh, but I'm, during the August recess, I want to meet with uh, with stakeholders uh, and, or, and and conduct roundtables with regard to this issue. Uh, do you have any suggestions for me? What has succeeded? Obviously, sir, you talked about the Baltimore model, and and I think that's very important. Are there any other innovative ideas or legislative initiatives that you would recommend uh, for my state of Florida? Anyone on the panel? Please. I just, I just might start by adding that one thing I, I wanted to convey to the panel, and I'm, I know you're very well aware of the STOP Act and this issue of keeping uh, fentanyl and carfentanil out of our country, where it's manufactured legally, sometimes illegally, and still shipped in and uh, mailed into our country. Um, the DEA recently informed us that the profit margin for these cartels that bring fentanyl in for a $6,000 investment to make that more of a heroin type substance is about a $1.6 million profit. To do it in pill form, just to press it into a pill, is a $6 million profit. And so with that kind of, again, and again the, the, the cartels, uh, that kind of profit margin out there for their taking, it's very difficult to combat this if we're flooded with it with impunity. We've got to figure out ways to stop it from coming into our country in the first place. And I think that'd be, again, I, that's not necessarily Florida specific, but I think that this idea that, that's contained in the STOP Act, and I won't comment on the specifics, but I understand that would, uh, again, curtail some of that. Is anyone else, please? If I could, fentanyl is changing the face of this epidemic, and we need to respond in our interventions. And one of the things that I would comment on is that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And we really need to take a look at prevention efforts as critical to changing the face of this epidemic and not cutting, not cutting our efforts in prevention, primary prevention, working with transitional aged youth. If we can stop their use before they use, we're not going to have them dying with fentanyl. I think we need more research. You know, it, recently we haven't had any new medications. We haven't had any new treatment models necessarily proposed for opioid use disorders. And I'm not sure enough effort has been 
placed into the research needs of this epidemic. And we need to start looking at this as we would, you know, the focus on cancer. This is an epidemic. We need research that's going to support the most evidence-based models that are effective in treating this. Thank I, you very much. Uh, I agree. I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just um, 